This series is based entirely on a true story. In the first shots we see Professor Valery Legasov in his apartment, recording the truth about the Chernobyl disaster on a tape recorder. It was April 26, 1988. Exactly two years have passed since the tragedy. Legasov said that Deputy Chief Engineer Anatoly Dyatlov was blamed for everything that happened. He received 10 years in prison for criminal negligence, and that sentence was unfair because there were far worse criminals than him. But none of this matters because the higher-ups finally got what they wanted. They convinced the public that justice had been served. When Legasov told the true cause of the accident at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, he turned off the recorder. He looked out the window and saw a car on the opposite side of the street. He was being followed all the time. Then Legasov packed up the cassettes and pretended to take out the trash. In fact, he hid the package with the cassettes in a safe place. When the professor returned to his apartment, he fed the cat, smoked a cigarette, put on a ceremonial suit, and voluntarily passed away. Further events take us back to two years earlier. A young woman Lyudmila Ignatenko felt nauseous in the middle of the night. Her husband Vasily was asleep at the time. When Lyudmila went to the kitchen for a drink of water, an explosion was heard in the distance. This woke Vasily up. He and his wife saw through the window how a beam of light rose from the nuclear power plant a couple of dozen kilometers away from Pripyat. At that time, in the fourth machine room, shift supervisor Alexander Akimov calls deputy chief engineer Anatoly Dyatlov, who had not immediately recovered from a shock. They were told that there was a fire in the turbine generator. Blaming his subordinates for what had happened, Dyatlov began giving out orders, hoping to prevent the consequences of the disaster. Coming out of the fourth engine room, he saw pieces of graphite under the windows. Meanwhile, we are shown in real recording of a conversation between the fire brigade operators. Vasily Ignatenko, who is off duty today, is going for an urgent departure. Lyudmila shares with him her fears that it is not just a fire, because the color of the flames is somehow strange. Meanwhile, the engineers found a dosimeter. The walls around them were crumbling, some thought it was war. Since the dosimeter did not show radiation levels above three and a half x-rays, it was difficult to determine the actual level of radiation exposure. In addition, the engineer's facial skin began to turn red. Some began to vomit and throw up. The engineers tried to find the senior operator of the main circulation pumps, Valery Kademchik. They were feeling worse and worse. Senior mechanical engineer Alexander Yuchenko saw with his own eyes the consequences of the core explosion. Dyatlov returned to the engine room and reported that he had lowered the brake rods into the core from another console. But Akimov said it was still up, so he sent the trainees to lower them manually. Dyatlov ordered to make sure the pumps were running. The firefighters had already arrived, it was 1.30 am. Vasily Ignatenko and his colleagues began actively extinguishing the fire, unaware that radioactive pieces of graphite were lying around. Some of them took it in their hands and could taste the metal in their mouths. Yuchenko told the trainees not to go to the reactor hall. The rods were destroyed, as was the reactor itself. Mikhail, who had previously held a piece of graphite in his hands, received a severe radiation burn. At this point, the trainees contrary to Yuchenko's warnings went to the core, which was no longer there. When they saw this, they rushed to run away from there. Yuchenko's body began to show burns. All the people in Pripyat were awakened by the turmoil. Neighbors suggested that Lyudmila go with them to the bridge, where they could see everything better, but she refused, thinking it might be dangerous. The engineer burst into the engine room and declared that the reactor was gone. Dyatlov still denied it and ordered Akimov to call the day shift. Akimov does not want to put people's lives in danger, but he could not disobey Dyatlov's order. At the hospital, doctors were preparing women in labor for delivery. So far everything was going quietly, but people were concerned about the fire at the power plant. One of the nurses asked if the hospital had iodine in pills. The head of the department doesn't understand why they need iodine. In the middle of the night Viktor Bryukhanov, director of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, received a call. Chief engineer Nikolai Fahman was already waiting for him. Dyatlov assured them that the situation was under control. Bryukhanov was obliged to report what had happened to the Central Committee, but first he wanted to look into what was going on himself. Dyatlov said that during safety tests of Unit 4 Akimov and Toptunov encountered difficulties, which led to the formation of hydrogen in the tank and consequently an explosion. According to Dyatlov, engineers are now feeding water into the reactor core. Radiation does not exceed three and a half X-rays. Bryukhanov told them to get a more accurate dosimeter out of the safe. Meanwhile, the people on the bridge were admiring the flames. Some wondered at the strange colors of the fire. 
The wind blew. No one suspected that dangerous radioactive dust was poisoning everyone right now. Adults and children rejoiced, finding the site beautiful. One of the engineers found Yuchenko, who was in a serious condition. He thought it was the end. Suddenly water started dripping on them. Meanwhile, outside, firefighters continue to extinguish the flames. They have to start making their way to the roof. It is up to Vasily to do this. He already realizes that something terrible is going on around him. Boris Toyarchik, the night shift operator, told Akimov that there were no more pumps and no electricity either. Akimov thinks that it is necessary to direct water to the reactor, otherwise it will melt. The only chance is to open the valves manually. In this case, they will receive a dose of radiation incompatible with life, but they have no choice. Stoyarchik thinks this is crazy, but Toptunov agreed with Akimov. The two of them went to the reactor, while Stoyarchik and Igor Kershenbaum, senior turbine control engineer, stayed in the engine room. The engineers from the new shift came. No one really understands what is going on. Anatoly Sitnikov, deputy chief engineer of the first stage, went to get a more accurate dosimeter. At this time, Viktor Brukhanov outlined the situation to the representatives of the executive committee. Bryukhanov was still unaware that the reactor was destroyed. According to him, the situation is under their control, and there is nothing to worry about. One member of the meeting said that the city should be evacuated, but Brukhanov still insisted that there was nothing dangerous. And the glow in the air is caused by the Cherenkov effect, which manifests itself even at minimal radiation levels. An elderly agent of the State Security Committee urged everyone to stay calm. Everything must be done to prevent panic among the people. It is also necessary to cut the telephone lines and not to let anyone out of the city to prevent a spread of disinformation. It is their duty to the country. All members of the assembly, inspired by this speech, began to applaud. Sidnikov waited for everyone to leave and told Bryukhanov, Fomin, and Dyatlov that the disimetrists had checked the radiation level with a Geiger counter with a maximum value of 1,000 Ronchen. The dosimeter burned out immediately after being turned on. Fomin and Brukhanov thought that the dosimeter was out of order. Then Zitnikov said that he walked around the fourth power unit. There are pieces of graphite lying on the ground around it. Dyatlov denied that this was possible because it meant that the reactor core had exploded. Sitnikov does not know how that can be, and Vaman accused him of incompetence. Suddenly Dyatlov vomited in front of everyone and fell down. Bryukhanov ordered the guards to take him to the hospital. Vaman believed that the reason was the industrial water with which Dyatlov had been in contact all night. He ordered Sitnikov to go to the roof of the fourth power unit and check the situation. Meanwhile, Akimov and Toptunov began to close the valves manually, standing in the radioactive water. Topnutov cannot hold back tears. He feels guilty about what happened. At that time Sidnikov went out on the roof of the reactor, as ordered. What he saw sent him into horror and shock. He had already realized that he is not alive. Meanwhile, the guards were taking Dyatlov out of the building. There was some kind of madness going on all around. Because of the radiation the firefighters lose consciousness. Dyatlov sees with his own eyes the destroyed power unit. Fomin tried to get an intelligible answer from Sidnikov, but he was still in a state of shock. During the night, the hospital began to bustle. Ambulances were bringing in many radiation victims. Early in the morning, chemist Professor Valery Legasov, deputy director of the Kurchatov Institute, received a call. The caller introduced himself as Boris Trebina, deputy chairman of the Council of Ministers and head of the Ministry of Energy. He talked about the incident at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. General Secretary Mikhail Gorbachev approved the commission for liquidation of the accident, and Legasov is a member of it. No questions about politics could be asked. Despite feeling terrible, Akimov and Toptunov continued to do their work. Both were on the verge of losing consciousness. The inhabitants of Pripyat are not yet aware that they are in the radioactive contamination zone. Everyone as if nothing had happened was hurrying about their business. No one paid any attention to the bird that had fallen on the asphalt.